Kelly Wright. All right, so um, we are pressed for time, so let's jump right in. I think we have all heard talks from the folks, except for Tyrone. Probably, so that's me. Let's have, let's have Tyrone introduce himself real quick. Oh, we sure. know everyone else on the panel, and then we will jump right in. You're, uh, you got a oh, mic right I got a mic there too. Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Hey, everybody. Can we hear? There's a switch. There's a switch. There's a switch. And it's super hot, that's so it. you can hold it kind of far. Hey, away. what's up, everybody? Hey. <laughs> There are so many familiar faces here. I'm happy to see. I'm going to do call outs. Larry, what's up, my man? We got to move quick, though, because we're, we're short on time. Alita, Carl, let's go. <laughs> happy you guys are here. All right. Also, I'm Ty. I do street epistemology. That's a really fun technique that I'll be talking about later on. I've been doing talks outside with most of you guys here. Thank you so much for having me here. This is my first time speaking in Lexington. Thanks. Sweet. So one of the fun things about moderating and doing talks about podcasting and blogging and content creation is that I get to work out my own anxiety uh, in doing these things. Um, so something that I have been struggling with and I would love uh, to hear your all's input on is I'm perpetually not necessarily thinking about um, what I make, but how I make decisions about what I make. Um, and so like, what stories do I tell? What things do I talk about? Because if we're talking about atheist secular stuff, we're talking about uh, racial justice, social justice, gender justice, all of those things, there is no shortage of uh, bad things to talk about, uh, right? And if I don't talk about all of those things, I feel like I'm perpetually failing my audience at not calling those things out. Um, but if I only talk about those things, I'm like beating everyone over the head with it. Um, and so whoever has thoughts and feelings about how you dis make decisions about what you create, the things you decide to talk about, I'm interested in uh, perspectives on that. Okay, um, I'll start by saying that there are a whole lot of amazing content creators, uh, like Callie, for example, who are talking about those very serious topics and giving you great information about it and leading you through great storytelling. Um, I actually do something a little bit different along with, uh, there's no illusions back, yeah, there's no illusions over there, Lucinda illusions as well. We, we do a, a couple of different podcasts where we're doing a little bit more of the um, pointing out the absurdity and you know the, the, the wacky stuff, the ridiculous stuff, it, try, trying to make it a, a little bit crazier, it'll be a little bit silly sometimes. That's not always the right tone for certain subjects, and those subjects are being covered amazingly by, again, a lot of different people. Mm. We kind of fill a different niche. Um, we go for the, that, that craziness, you know, kind of preaching to the choir idea is how we do it, but I think there's absolutely big value in both. Yeah. I know for my website, when I'm writing articles about news stories or something, I always think to myself, I don't really care what the atheists who are the sort of people who would be in this room, I don't really care what you all think because you probably overlap with my own views in a lot of ways, so I'm not writing for you. When I'm writing, I'm writing for random people who might be curious about that issue and how atheists in general, because I represent everybody, might think about it, and what Christians who might be curious what the other side has to say about an issue, what they might think about it. Um, it, not that this happens all the time, but I w I'm always thinking like, if this gets quoted somewhere, what are they going to pull? And is it the thing I want them to take from this? So that's kind of in the back of my head. I'm writing for an audience that would never come to this sort of thing, even though I'm writing as if I'm talking to all of you. I don't really content create, <laughs> so I, this is not really a question for me. I don't know. You gave a talk, right? Well, I, okay. That's content. Um, How that do you was answer a, questions? That was a talk that was <laughs> relevant to me because not only did I know that I was having, I'm not a bad researcher, right? So I mean, I can research a thing, and when I can't find an answer to it and it's plaguing me, I believe that I'm not the only person in the atheist community that's having that same issue that would like to know what happened to them or what was going on. And so I just looked at it as this is relevant to me. And when I go to conferences, I talk to a lot of people who seem to be struggling with the same thing. And we're hearing from people who don't seem to understand it, who haven't had the experience. And so kind of like what um, Hamant was saying, you have this uh, two audiences, right? So you've got the audience that it actually is speaking to in a very direct way. And then you have the peripheral audience that then also um, is kind of has something they can learn from it as well about their misconceptions about what's happening. Um, 
one of the projects that I was just working on recently was a long, super exciting history of the Pledge of Allegiance. But I know when I was making that, I think everyone here knows if I asked you, hey, when was Under God inserted into the Pledge? You would probably have a rough answer to that. And I know random people who don't think about the Pledge as much as we do may not know the history of that. They may not know a lot of stuff that all of us have come to know about it. So I know, it's, again, it's a new project, so my thought was, if I'm coming from the outside and I didn't know anything atheists know about the Pledge, what would be interesting, what would they want to know? It, and again, it, it's a lot of how I go into making videos, how I go into uh, talking about issues on a podcast or writing about them too. Uh, the content that I make is focused on a misconception that we can't have a conversation about God or money or politics, but particularly the God question, that seems to be the one that's most taboo. Um, the content that I'm proposing is to challenge that idea by demonstrating that it is possible to have those conversations if you do it in a very particular way, a way that's actually not hard at all. And it just takes a little bit of openness on your part to have that willingness conversation with someone and be patient with them. And you can actually make some really great progress in short periods of time. Um, I didn't know that at the time when I got into this hobby. And when I moved to Knoxville, uh, it was a point where I had become an atheist. I moved to a new city. I didn't have a support group. I didn't have a culture. I didn't have a group that I can reach out to that I knew of at the time. And it felt very isolated. I felt very isolated. When I tried to use this method I learned on YouTube, like uh, SE, Street Epistemology, I realized now I know I can actually have a conversation with anyone about anything, particularly about God, which is an uh, epiphany that I reached when I was uh, coming out as an atheist. So that's why I wanted to uh, show more people this kind of demonstrable way to get through to people about their God beliefs. Yeah, I think it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the Building Communities panel, right? Um, so we, we build platforms of like rock star activists, podcasters, bloggers, YouTubers, and I think there are a whole lot of people who want to do this kind of thing but feel like they can't because they lack some charisma, they feel like what they, don't, what they have to say isn't interesting enough. Um, and I think kind of what I'm hearing in the panel is that like, I mean, like I'm a person with a perspective, right? There's no way I'm the only person who thinks this. And so it's valuable to just like, let me just make what's interesting to me and it'll matter to someone. Yeah. I have no perspective, to be fair. I just want to be clear, like I'm every majority group ever, so I, I try to keep that in mind along the way. It just occurred to me as you said that, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, I have the luxury of knowing that if the archive of my entire website is available online, and I tried, I, I cringe at stuff I wrote yesterday, much less like 12, 13 years ago, but it's all there. And I think going to what Kelly is saying, if you are interested in doing any of it, whether it's blogging, podcast, YouTube, whatever it is, start doing it. If you want to write a book, go do it. Go self-publish it. It's fine. Like, just put it out there because you'll learn stuff along the way. And if this is a hobby that is still interesting to you, you will find a way to get better at it. The thing that you do what you can, try to make it as good as it can possibly be. And then like, whatever, a month from now, a year from now, you're gonna look at that and say, oh my goodness, that was horrible. Uh, I can't watch that, it was really bad. And yet, I'm sure if people found, like Kelly was saying, if people found your old stuff, they will recognize that like, you are speaking to me, like you are saying something I needed to hear. It matters to somebody out there. I can tell you this, I can see the, the analytics on my site and like 60 to 70% of people who are visiting the site are probably reading something that was just posted recently. All the rest of them are on that long tail somewhere. They're looking at old stuff that I've tried, I would wipe off the face of the internet if I could, but someone's looking that stuff up. It matters to them somehow, because you don't Google onto something from 2007 randomly. <laughs> so like, put it out there if you can, because you, and I have heard this 100% of the time from anyone who does any content creation, whether they have a couple subscribers on YouTube or like a whole bunch, every single one of them hands down has said, I have heard from somebody who stumbled upon the thing I made and they wanted to reach out to say how much they appreciated it. I have never not heard that from someone who just started making, and it's not like they advertised it, 
they just like uploaded it to YouTube with whatever title kind of made sense for it. Um, I'm 36 and I think one thing that surprises me is the stuff I used to Google when I was questioning my faith is stuff people now go to YouTube and type in mm. and they'll find the stuff there. They're not doing what I did when I was questioning. And so that they're looking for this stuff, stuff that we may not think about anymore because we've been doing this for a while. Just two things to add to that. I love seeing old stuff on popular channels because it gives me the idea that I can make mistakes too. And I love that. Also, you will cultivate your audience as long as you stay consistent with the message that you're trying to send out. And that's free to evolve over time. But I'd say instead of chasing that crowd that you're trying to get, let them come to you. And the people that like you for who you are will, the, will be the ones that stick with you for the long term. Yeah, what I love saying when somebody's like, I want to start a podcast. I'm afraid it's going to suck. Yes, actually it will. Your first <laughs> podcast episode will suck without fail. Like, <laughs> like that's just the way it is. The thing is, though, that's okay, right? The first time anyone tries anything, normally they're terrible at it, right? The idea is you keep at it and you get good, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I thought somebody else. Yeah, so I would just say, um, when I think about somebody, for example, like Bart Ehrman, who's writing books, this is a person that went into you know, school for Bible study when they believed. They lost their belief along the way, but what they didn't do was quit school and say, oh, I'm wasting my time on this. They went, he went ahead and got the degree and then he started writing books about what he learned to basically tell everybody else, here's what they teach you in Bible college that nobody <laughs> tells you in church. And I have a friend who um, is in a very cloistered Jewish community in the Northeast and was Plan, like being pushed toward going into rabbinical studies and he was asking me like how do I get out of this and I said get out of it do it right like go and do it do your rabbinical studies become a rabbi and then be the Jewish Bart Ehrman like get this get this degree because um, that would be a degree that was supported and at first he was just like oh I, you know I don't want to do it and I was like well if it won't make you happy obviously you, you can't I don't, I'm not going to suggest that you do it but even there are so many people who are just like, oh, I feel like I wasted so much time with these studies or I feel like I, and it's like, you know, you can take that cred and turn it on uh, the thing that wasted your time and keep somebody else from wasting time by explaining things like this. So it's just interesting when you kind of think of a thing. They have that thing where um, the saying about how problems can be opportunities, right? A problem arises, it's an opportunity. It's like, well, is it a problem that you're going to, to this? seminary or that you're going to go to this rabbinical studies or is this an opportunity you don't believe you're going to go do it and um let's see what you what you get you, then when you write a book as a as an ex-jewish kid that dropped out of studies um, it doesn't sell as much as if you're going to be the guy that got the actual degree that became the rabbi and then said okay i'm an atheist i'm an atheist rabbi and this is why yeah, well, and I think that speaks to the idea of uh, continually being a student. So for me, I, there will never be a point where I'm just like, well, I'm a good podcaster. I'm just going to keep doing what I do, right? And I feel like that's a very obvious thing to say if you're talking about any other uh, discipline. But when we think about creative things, podcasts, YouTube channels, blogs, whatever, um, so much of the, the hard work that gets folks there happens behind the scenes, right? And all of the learning and work that goes into studying people who do it the way that we like it to be done. And so I'm interested in hearing from the panel, like, what is the behind the scenes stuff that you all do to, to, to be a student and to get better at what you do? I'll answer that in a second. I was going to say, yeah. uh, piggybacking on what Tracy was saying, anytime a high schooler says, like, I think I'm an atheist, but my parents are making me go to church or something, I say the same thing. Yeah, go. Go learn that stuff so that it, you have a better position from which to refute it later and then keep reading stuff. Let me think about your question for a second. I am done thinking about the question. <laughs> I have my answer. You're stalling. Um, I, I do have an answer. Um, I, I've, definitely, I've definitely learned along the way of, of doing our show, in particular from two, three, four very intelligent people that I'm lucky enough to work with. In particular, it kind of relates to the stuff I was talking about earlier with Uncle John. Um, I've learned to have more empathy. I really have. And um, you might know Eli Bosnick in particular. He's a very empathetic person. He's uh, behind the scenes. 
I'm talking to him, I'm asking him, why am I wrong about X, Y, and Z? And he talks me down from my stupid wrong position on a regular basis, and I become a little more enlightened if I pay attention to that, and it's really helpful. And I think audiences react well to that. I think, you know, having a wrong position and learning to have it righted is a virtue, and mm -hmm. I'm lucky enough to have people who can do that for me. And being honest and vulnerable about the same. Things. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, I know if I'm, in terms of research, if I'm writing an article commenting on some news story, I try my best whenever it's possible to see what my opponents have, uh, cultural, what religious people have said about that same issue. What are the Christian groups saying about this lawsuit? Because maybe I try to write my post first, just this is what I'm thinking about this issue. Then I will go see what they wrote to make sure, did I address that? And if I didn't, maybe I need to add some stuff to it or quote them because this is a relevant thing. But one thing that definitely helps me is I try to see what's already been out there, if people have commented, and make sure I've addressed their concerns if they pointed any out. That's great. Yeah, I don't know if this relates to content creation so much, but I find that one of the things that helps me kind of keep learning is to invest in communities of which I'm not a part. So I, a lot of times, will sign on for like threads. Um, I know, Callie, at your page, just the transgender discussions. And I rarely would comment. I mainly would just listen, right? Go there. And especially if I see an OP where somebody's saying something that I initially think I don't understand or disagree with, and then I'll go and I'll read the thread, and I will see what the people who are living the experience are saying about it and what this means to them versus what I'm thinking it means to them. And I change my mind almost every time. It's just about learning what's happening with these people instead of me assuming what's happening or looking at it from my perspective where I have no insight into what's happening in, in this particular situation except from the outside. So one of the things that I find is like a helpful learning tool is just literally eavesdropping online for groups that I am not a member of to find out what their experience is. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Going after Tracy is rough. Good answer. Going really after good Tracy answer. is rough. Yeah. My answer is a little bit more tangential. I've learned a lot of cool, random things in the process of trying to get like my videos and audio stuff out. I don't think you can learn things in a vacuum. I think you, whatever you pick up, you can apply to a whole bunch of other skill sets. And in the process of making, like for example, the podcast with uh, Larry and uh, the radio show that we do, I've learned about voice compression, proper <laughs> mixing, audio levels. Um, bit rates, all sorts of really cool things that I can use to make better kazoo music or whatever I want. <laughs> if you want to talk about some cool stuff, I learned about making jingles in a really, really cool way. So like I have like different jingles for different kinds of stuff that I make and I went into such a deep rabbit hole of making solid, quick little fun music that takes up like five seconds to the point where now when I hear jingles I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> I like what he did there. Yeah, that's really smart. But yeah, there's definitely, dude, there's so many things you can learn uh, from just applying yourself and, and pouring yourself into something that you actually love. Yeah, the best way to learn a thing is to do a thing and then maybe to teach a thing, right? Yeah. yeah. I was just gonna add one other thing that I'm noticing about this weekend, actually. I mentioned before, I'm, you know, perspectiveless being from all the different majority groups, but being at a place like this and just, um, the answer is shut the fuck up and listen, and I've been able to do that, and it's a whole bunch of intelligent people, and I'm able to hear great perspectives, and I'm able to, to learn a little bit and become, you know, not quite so uh, whatever I started as. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's been a very positive experience. Thank you to everybody who's kind of teaching me. And so we've got three minutes left, not a ton of time, but um, I'm curious, each of you, um, we've, we've talked a lot about sort of general philosophy. If um, making the content that you make, because everyone up here is somewhat seasoned in doing whatever it is that they do. If you could go back in time, like before you hit publish on your first podcast episode or video or blog post or whatever it is, what would you tell yourself? Use a pseudonym. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> Did it. Yep. Don't call yourself friendly. What are you doing? <laughs> Don't call yourself scathing, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, I would add um, a lot of the stuff that I thought was cringeworthy now, looking back on stuff, it's a lot of, let me tell you, 
this goes to the pseudonym thing. I would talk about what I was going through or what um, I thought was interesting to like my inner circle of people that I hung out with. And that, that is interesting to me. And it's interesting to nobody else. And I think one of the shifts I've done with writing online anyway is I tell you nothing about me anymore. You know nothing about me. And I focus way more on trying to explain something just to straight. I'm just the third person omniscient narrator, hopefully, and you never know anything about me. And that has actually helped me with what I do. We're going to start the medium atheist. There's one thing I tell myself. Um, it's I'm so glad you started because when I did this, I'm setting up, I'm dragging a table and two chairs out in the middle of a park in Kentucky. This is like extreme black sports. <laughs> really? It's like, hey, I'm going to talk to you about your goggle if we're going to really dive down into it, perfect strangers. And it's just the most nerve wracking thing to jump into. But if I could look back at myself, I'd just say, hey, man, I'm really glad that you started doing this. Yeah. Gosh, I was going to add my perspective, but I think that's really it. Like, you're good. Just hit the publish button. Just yeah. do it. I've heard people say that about like dieting too. Don't say I'm going to start the diet next week. No, no, no. You're starting it. Go push publish. It is going to suck, but it <laughs> yeah. will get better. Right. But again, the hardest thing for anyone who's considering doing any of this stuff is like actually putting the first one out there, do it, and then stick to your schedule and keep doing it and get better. Awesome. That is our time, friends. Thank you.